A man is found brutally disfigured and murdered, and the answers to who did it was closer to home. Hello, true crimeers. This is the case of Craig Rideout. Viewer discretion is advised. Wallace Rideout was born on April 24, 1966, in Pittsburgh, New York. He graduated from Pittsburgh Menden High School in 1984, and then graduated from Union College in 1988. Craig was employed at the time of this case by the Federated Clover Investment Advisors, and he was a senior technical specialist slash analyst and programmer. And he had actually been doing that since the late 80s, early 90s. Craig's sister, Robin, would say that Craig was a wonderfully funny individual. He had a, an astute sense of humor. Craig also loved writing and reading, and he loved listening to music to relax. And she said that he absolutely loved and adored his family. Craig had met a woman named Laura Assam. They met at a pub, they hit it off, they became a couple, and by January of 1993, Craig and Laura were married. Craig's sister Robin would say with regards to the couple that they were absolutely enamored with each other, at least at first. She said that when you looked at both of them, you could see this twinkle in their eyes, that they were meant for each other, they were madly in love. A few months after their marriage, they actually had their first child, Colin. And then six more kids would follow after that. They had seven total children. And to accommodate the large family, they bought a nice, you know, big house in Pittsburgh, New York. But they also began to realize that having to support seven children and, you know, accommodating them in a, in a bigger house, well, it became too much financially. Craig, at, at a point, was considering, well, we might need to file for bankruptcy at this point because we're not, we're not making enough to pay what we need to pay and also support all of us. So they ended up moving out of that house and into a more modest, uh, slightly, you know, smaller home, a more affordable home. Laura for whatever reason, believed that Craig was holding out on her, that he had a lot more money than he said he did, that he was hiding money from her. And the financial difficulties would create, obviously, stress and a fracture within the marriage, and their marriage began to slowly crumble. Laura and some of the kids uh, wouldn't show up to family gatherings anymore, like they wouldn't show up to Thanksgiving or Christmas dinners, Easter dinners. They just stop going. Only a couple of the kids, and it would be like random ones, that would go with Craig to these family gatherings. By the summer of 2014, Laura would file for divorce from Craig. Around that time, she began to have a relationship with a family friend of theirs named Paul Tucci. Paul had known the rideouts for quite some time, but it still came to kind of a surprise that he and Laura became an item, because he had just lost his wife. Her, his wife had passed away from natural causes. Laura and Paul, they became really close and they would end up moving into the uh, house together. And then it would be five of the children who would end up moving also into the house with Laura and Paul. The two youngest children who were six and 12 years old would end up staying with Craig. This would then lead to a very tumultuous, very uh, bitter custody battle. The custody battle just even get further chipped away at whatever friendship or relationship would be left between Craig and Laura. It was just completely begin. It was just decimated at that point. On July 19th, 2016, sometime around seven o'clock in the morning, Craig and his sister would have a phone conversation. According to his sister, Craig was just looking forward to the next custody hearing. It kind of seems like he was feeling positive about what the outcome would be. And then when they were done talking, they said, you know, goodbye, I love you. And that was it. That would be the last time that Craig's sister ever spoke to him again. Craig and his sister were very, very close. They talked all the time. And when he didn't answer the phone after several attempts the, pre the following day, she became worried. She was concerned. She then calls his work. His work tells her that he didn't show up for work either. But he actually called off. Well, sort of. He emailed off. He would email the company and say, hey, I'm not coming in today. 
which Robin, the, the sister, found that incredibly bizarre. Robin then goes to Craig's house, and when she walks in the house, the door's unlocked, she sees Laura in the house, and she's wiping down a counter. And Robin's like, what are you doing? What are you even doing here? And Laura said, well, the kitchen is just really smelly, so I had to clean it, clean it up. Uh, okay, but still, what are you doing here? Like, Robin searched all over the house to see if she could find, well, one, Craig, and two, any sign of where he may have gone. And then Laura leaves the house. Uh, and at that point, Robin decides to call the police and report her brother missing. When police got to the house to talk to Robin, they said that we can't go in the home. Like, we need a warrant to be able to go in. Or we need permission by the person who owns this house. But then, on the morning of July 20th, 2016, about 50 miles away from Craig's home, there would be some people who were walking along this kind of desolate rural type road and they walked kind of into this wooded area where they saw this big bright colored tarp. The person approaches the tarp and with a stick kind of lifts up part of it and when they do so they see a foot, a human foot. And at that point they're like, whoa, okay, I don't, I don't know what this is about and they bolted. And then they go to the nearest residence they can find and they call 911. When they arrive, police, they carefully remove the tarp to find that there is, in fact, a human body underneath the tarp. And this person was very clearly deceased. This person was very much disfigured. Next to the body were these little white bottle caps, which would later be determined to be to be from like, a, like these bottles of acid. And it was evident that this person's face had been doused in that acid. And the person did that, whoever did it, to hide who this person was. They didn't want them to be recognized by their face. This person also had their face bashed in with a hammer. They also found a homemade uh, garrot. It was it was like put together with this blue duct tape. Um, and it was clearly used to potentially strangle this particular victim and it had blood on it. It was evidence that whoever did this to him used a lot of force because it actually ripped away part of his flesh and it broke part of his neck. The police, once they found the body and they also heard about this missing persons report that was filed the day before, they are able to get Craig's dental records and they can now confirm that the body they found in that tarp was the body of Craig Rideout. Now police have probable cause to get a warrant to enter Craig Rideout's home. As they enter the house, there is really nothing out of the ordinary. Like everything seems to be in place. There's no kicked in doors, no broken windows. There's no forced entry in this house. Everything is relatively clean. Everything seems neat and tidy. There is no real evidence of a crime scene throughout the house until they get to the basement. When they get down to the basement, it's when they find that there is blood kind of sprayed. They find like little tiny droplets of blood on walls. They find little droplets of blood on like these those big blue tubs. There's blood on this piece of wood. They're, they're finding blood kind of just splattered all over this basement. And at that point, they realized that what they were standing in was the crime scene. This is where Craig Rideout was killed. The blood later confirmed to be his blood through DNA. Now the question is, who done it? Well, the first person they look to at this point is his ex-wife, Laura. When they go to where Laura is living with Paul, uh, they see a, a moving van outside. And when they are questioning them inside the house, they see a bunch of moving boxes. Everything is looks, it's kind of messy in the house, but it looks like they're in the middle of packing. And Laura and Paul were planning to move to North Carolina. And this would have been just right after Craig died. And through all of this, police then discover about the tumultuous custody battle and how it was very heated, how it was just causing a humongous rift in this family. And they look at that as definitely a motive. They also find out when looking through their computer records and email records that Craig's son, Colin, had sent an email to his dad, Craig. The email was Colin accusing Craig of being emotionally abusive, manipulating, and at times uh, physically, not so much abusive, but just phys physically 
scary, I guess you can say. And Colin had CC'd like the entire family on this on this uh, email, including Craig's you know sister and his his family. So they're getting kind of closer and closer to what may have happened and what the motive here was. Police also use cell phone data, and they are tracking like Craig's cell phone movements. They see that his cell phone was moving sometime around three o'clock in the morning in Yates County along the roadside. They go to the uh, businesses on that road and they are able to get some CCTV footage of one, you see a black car speeding by and then within a, just a few moments, you see like a white minivan drive by. The white minivan is actually the car that belongs to Craig. And it's basically the only two cars on the road at that time. And it looks like that black car is was basically driving, or they were probably grouped with whoever was driving this white minivan. So there may have been multiple people involved in Craig's murder. Then, the following day, on July 21st, 2016, police get an anonymous tip to go check out the Devil's Bathtub. This is, it's like a little pond that there is some suspicious activity going on at that pond as we speak. And so police and detectives get there as soon as possible, and they find two people, Colin and Alexander Rideout, two of Craig's sons. They are seen there throwing these garbage bags into the pond, and they're trying to dump things in there. Police are able to take those trash bags, collect them, and open them. Inside, they find drain cleaner with missing bottle caps. They find uh, bloody gloves, bloody clothes, like a pair of jeans, a pair of shorts. The blood belonged to Craig, and the clothing belonged to, it was a combination of a couple people, it belonged to Colin, Alexander, and Laura. They're then able to track purchases made at a Lowe's store, but also a couple different Walmart stores to see that people were buying these items. They were buying the drain cleaner, the gloves, uh, paper towels, the shovels. Like, like they're able to find a whole bunch of things that was purchased by this family in the moments leading up to possibly when Craig was murdered. So they're able to pull up CCTV footage. They do in fact find that at one point, Laura and Paul are seen going in and out of a Walmart on a couple different occasions. They also see the two sons, Alexander and Colin, entering another Walmart, purchasing a shovel. And you can actually see the car pull up to the front of the Walmart, it's a little black car, which was pretty much matched the description of that little black car they saw driving on that CCTV footage of the other cameras. The shovel itself was actually found near the crime scene. It was lying just in the grass. And they're able to confirm that that shovel, based on that shovel's UPC code, that it was purchased from a certain Walmart, and they linked it to the receipts of what the two sons had purchased. So they had physical evidence in terms of blood being found on the clothing of the two sons and also Laura. They have all four of these people, including Paul, going into these stores to buy the exact products that were found in that trash bag that were dumped into the pond. And these were items that had blood on them that also linked back to Craig. Being, this bag is being thrown away by his two sons. So everything is linking together. Everything is like just lining up that it was clear that Laura, Colin, Alexander, and potentially uh, Paul Tucci was involved in this murder. By July 21st, July 22nd, all four of them are arrested and charged with their connections to this murder. The motive was very clear. There was the custody battle with these two kids and Laura didn't like that. She won the custody of all of the kids, and she did not like that Craig was trying to fight this, that, you know, trying to get custody of the kids. She wanted to move to North Carolina, move to a different state, to be with her new man, with all the kids, and just leave Craig behind. Well, Craig is also their father. Craig is their dad, and you know, there are there are stories that say, like, he may not have been, like, the most perfect dad. He wasn't, like, uh, maybe not even dad of the year, but he by many accounts was trying so hard to kind of turn that around and become a really good father. He was never truly physically abusive to them. 
Um, he just he wanted to actually take parenting classes at one point to kind of learn to become a better father. It just sounds like he was maybe under he was under a lot of stress with like the financial issues and having to move to a smaller house and he was just he was he was under a lot of pressure. No one could ever actually corroborate that he was ever physically abusive to any of the kids or his wife. Emotionally abusive? Yeah. But <laughs> angry parents they scream at their kids all the time. And, you know, married couples scream at the highest levels possible all the time. It's normal. It's life. Craig was a good dad. I mean, he wasn't perfect, but he was good. He wanted to make sure that his kids were being taken care of. So all four of them go on trial. And initially, all four of them are charged with actual murder charges, burglary charges, uh, tampering with evidence, covering up a murder, all sorts of like, you know, things like that. Laura and Colin were both found guilty of second degree murder and also guilty of tampering with evidence. Laura and Colin, who at the time of their sentencing, Laura was 46, Colin was 24. They were both sentenced to 25 years to life, which was the maximum punishment they could receive. Alex Rideout was acquitted of the murder charges, but he was found guilty of tampering with evidence. And he was only sentenced to two to eight years in prison. Paul Tucci, who was uh, charged with murder and all that, was actually acquitted on all charges related to this crime. There was no evidence to show that he participated in the murder. There was no evidence to even really show that he knew what was going on in terms of all those purchases that were being made at the Walmarts. Even though he was present, they couldn't really establish that he really knew why they were purchasing those things. I was reading um, from an article on Medium, the website Medium, that one of them received an email from Paul Tucci after this case was covered. And what he said was, quote, Frankly, I have never seen a one more one-sided reporting on the topic ever. Robin Rideout is the least credible resource, and she was not only uninvolved in the Rideout affairs for 20 years, she had the most to gain from his death. She is now the sole heir to the Rideout estate, and also the insurance agent for the Rideout clan. Your failure to even research any other aspect makes you complicit in the whole sham. I know the truth, and your piece is pure fiction. And frankly, I know more than the two of you combined. Well, Paul, I uh, hate to break it to you, but there's this thing called physical evidence, blood evidence, that is found all over the place. The items that were found with the body were confirmed to be purchased by your dear, lovely Laura and by her two kids. Those items linked directly to the murder and the, where the body was dumped bloody clothes with Craig's blood, clothing that they confirmed was worn by the two sons and by Laura. That puts them in the murder scene. That puts them there. Not to mention the CCTV footage of the cars driving by, everything being captured on camera. You also had Laura in Craig's house, unannounced and uninvited, cleaning up when she had no business being there. And she probably got interrupted to the point where she couldn't clean up the basement because there's blood in that basement, Craig's blood. You also have an incredibly strong motive, the custody battle. It is a, an, a motive that has been used time and time again by people. People have killed their ex-spouses over custody battles. It's, it happens far too often. often. It also happens during divorce proceedings when one side is gonna get a whole bunch of money, someone ends up dead. There is no way that Laura and the two sons weren't involved directly in the murder. It's just impossible. The evidence is there. The prosecution showed it. They proved it. It was a prosecutor's burden to prove their guilt, and he succeeded. The jury saw the evidence, saw, heard all the testimony. It was them. And I don't really care what the other side says in terms of, well, you got some of this wrong, you got some of that wrong. You don't know the whole story. So now it almost sounds like he's trying to imply that Robin did this. Well, there was no physical evidence uh, to show that she did this. All the evidence, all of it, pointed to Laura and the two sons. And hell, even Paul. The person from Medium actually says in this, in this article that they wrote him back and said, okay, well... If you are aware of the inaccuracies, if you have anything that you can set the record straight with me, set, let me know. He never responded to her. Laura Rideout uh, never apologized, never admitted what she did. 
She showed no remorse. The two sons, who at times were seen smiling in court, they also showed no remorse. What was in it for them? I don't, I don't know. Did their mother coerce them into participating in this? Was there actually physical abuse? I mean, there was no evidence to show that there was any actual physical abuse, just emotional. It, really, it was just evidence of a fractured family life, which is incredibly common. But most families, when they have just sort of like a, a love-hate relationship with each other, don't necessarily murder one another. Usually, they just kind of separate and go their separate ways. They argue, but they don't kill each other. That's not the answer. Because now, the, the bitter irony is that all of Laura and Craig's children, they all don't have parents anymore. Their father is dead, and their mother could possibly be in prison for the rest of her life. Those two young kids that they murdered Craig for to have custody of, now they don't have their actual parents anymore. That's the outcome. When you kill someone for to get custody of kids, you're going to get caught, and then those two kids don't have any parents or whatever multiple men and children, depending on the story. It's just I really wish people would think this shit through before they act on this kind of thing. Because really all it shows is you're not actually thinking of the kids. You're thinking of yourself. But in the end, the police, the prosecutor's office, they worked hard on this case. They found the evidence and it really wasn't hard to find it. I mean, everyone was arrested within days of the murder. They weren't even, they were horrible at covering this up. They were horrible about hiding anything. It was messy. It was all over the place. Clearly, they have never watched a true crime show in their lives. You also have to know that there's cameras literally everywhere you go. Everywhere. You're going to be caught on camera. We can look up receipts in purchases like that now. We have GPS on our phones. And if you have a, the, the dead person's phone still on the person, that phone is still tracking. Not just, they don't have to be alive for their phone to still track. It's just insane to me that people still do this and don't think they can get away with it. Like it's, and people do, it must be fair. People get away with it still. Like obviously we have a lot of unsolved and cold cases from years, years and years ago, decades ago, but that was before we had the technology we have now. I mean, even back in 2016, when this happened, it's like, we were super advanced. You know, you're gonna get caught. So what's the point? But thankfully, like I said, the police and the prosecutor's office did their job. They did it well. They got all the necessary evidence. They presented it to a jury. The jury said, this is good evidence. And we believe that these people are responsible for this murder. And so in the end, Craig Rideout got the justice he rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case. True crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. Um, as usual, uh, if you're new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories, obviously. Sometimes spooky stories, kind of randomly. Uh, but please feel free to subscribe if you're into that kind of thing. Uh, I have a whole bunch of videos on here, hundreds of them to, for you to look through. I also tell short form true crime stories over on TikTok. The links to my TikTok are in the description of this video below in the link tree. So feel free to follow them if you want to. And then lastly, if there's a case you want me to cover, just send me a quick email. My email is listed as well below. Uh, send me the name of the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add it to the list. The list is over 6,300 names long. I pick my cases at random, so I can't promise you when I'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. But that is it for this video, True Crime Aroonies. And so until the next time, ta-ta for now. Waka waka. Who wants to hear a funny ass joke? No one, Mike. No one. Mm-hmm.